the RK selection model of a species reproduction is a useful way of looking at why particular species may reproduce and have the life cycles that they do based on certain environmental pressures that over time their population is adapting to. We'll also look at how a couple of basic mathematical equations uh, fit at least reasonably this sort of dichotomy between what we call R-selected species and K-selected species. So first a little background. The two equations that we're going to be looking at are exponential growth and logistic growth. And they help explain where the R-K uh, symbology comes from. Uh, R-selected species tend to have very rapid growth. In other words, defining character of their population increase over time is the rate and a rate that seems to accelerate their growth as long as there are not limiting factors in the environment to slow their spread. Uh, as we can see, a lot of the species that we tend to associate on the R side of reproductive patterns tend to be uh, a lot of members of the plant kingdom. Uh, we had students throw suggestions, dandelions was a good one, bacteria, uh, and then a lot of our invertebrates like cockroaches, crabs, and uh, this continues to some extent in, into maybe some of the fish groups uh, in, the, in the vertebral class of, of a life. So they are characterized by relatively short lifespans. They produce a high number of offsprings with sort of the assumption that a lot of them will not make it to adulthood and reproduce. Uh, they tend to have little to no parental involvement. For example, wildflowers just let the seed uh, get blown by the wind very often. Many uh, invertebrates lay eggs and often die shortly after laying their eggs and the and thus the they come the offspring come out fully hatched. Their the, so their lifespans, their embryonic stages are fairly brief. And also well, another factor that we want to look at is that it, um, the innate behavior in animal in the animals. is very high as far as the ratio of innate to learn behavior. And this is because they don't have parental involvement to, to teach them the art of living, so to speak. And we can model their growth, more or less, at least for a certain amount of time, with this equation, where we take our initial population, we call that p naught. So let's say we start looking at the population at whatever point in time, and so that would be right here at the axis on the PT, population over time graph. And then that population will start growing at an exponential rate. Euler's number is the classic exponential growth multiplier. It's an irrational number like pi, and we can approximate it. 2.718. You see Euler's number everywhere in math, science, business, economics, stats, wherever you see it. It's just basically a part of a function of continuous growth. Uh, Euler's number gets applied by its rate to time in the exponent itself. So R is a rate that has been modeled for that particular species, at least for a certain understood time interval. And then the T, the time is whatever we predict the population will be at a particular point in time. And at that particular point in time, we should have a predicted population or PT. So the, we are assuming that these are representative of the same point in time span. So, it, not surprisingly, think we can imagine that things like trees, wildflowers, cockroaches, spiders will reproduce fairly quickly and if left unchecked, will continue to have an explosive growth in population. Eventually, of course, environmental pressures, biotic and abiotic, whether it is 
running out of food or the appearance of a predator will put a check on this growth. And a lot of a tendency of a lot of these species is to collapse very quickly. Um, once again, there can be a, uh, they can quickly eat themselves out of house and home. But another factor is that they tend to occupy often unstable environments. And thus, in a sense, they're sort of opportunistic. So when a forest gets cleared, uh, suddenly you have full sunlight, no competition, and then there are species like ragweed and dandelions that will quickly come in and explode very fast until eventually that field starts getting some competition, uh, trees start growing and start shading them out and the population collapses. On the other hand, we have on the, on the continuum of reproductive strategies, if we wanted to look at the other extreme, when we get into things like mammals, reptiles, and birds, we have the, what we would call K selection. And this is a reproductive pattern that tends to involve long lifespans uh, where the parents have less offspring but give, have longer gestation periods, longer embryonic or pregnancy phases. Uh, like the extreme of an elephant that's 18 months. Uh, and there's a moderate to high amount of parental involvement. For example, wolves will, uh, and bears will stay with their young you know, for months at a time after they're born, birds at least for several days, um, you know, humans for hopefully their lifetimes. Uh, and thus, we wind up having a much slower growth pattern. Also, another environmental characteristic is that they tend to occupy more stable environments. They have, quote, territories. And so they tend to thus try to reach a sort of equilibrium with their environment here. And we call that the carrying capacity, or K. So let's say that we have, let's say, wolves cross uh, a, a, a lake when it's frozen and reach an island. They, and if there's decent habitat, then that what will happen is, is their population will grow quickly and uh, eventually it will have to level off as we run out of food. But because uh, there is a tendency more of, of more learned behavior with a lot of our K-selected species. They eventually take part in, in types of behaviors that uh, slow down reproduction, that undergo partitioning of resources and territories. And while it is true all species can undergo population crashes, there is a tendency, if there's a certain amount of success over time, that we reach maybe not what we would call a steady state but a fluctuation of populations around what we call the K, the carrying capacity. We have here a more complex equation. And what we have is that we are trying to reach from P naught in the beginning of a population to some sort of level where growth tapers off. And this is where the environmental forces have put the, the growth up population in check, but in a sense, it winds up being sort of harmonious, harmonious rather than boom and bust. Once again, population busts can happen, even with higher mammals, depending on the environmental pressures. But the model pretty much makes an assumption that a, a fairly steady uh, peak will be reached. As you can see in this equation, which uh, definitely is a bit more of a challenge in the calculator, we have a negative in front of the growth rate. So we are assuming that we're going to have growth by the way this equation is written. But this negative is part of the equation that causes the, the, the growth rate to taper, actually. So you can see why this equation looks different from this one. We have a beginning population and we're, and we're trying to reach a final population, at least in the model. And, but to make sure that we can reach this, we have to have a declining rate of growth to where the growth tapers off to almost zero. So why is this uh, practical to uh, model this sort of way? 
Well, logistical growth is uh, modeling is very important in the conservation and management of wildlife, like from deer and other game species, as well as endangered species. A lot of a lot of calculations and research need to be done to determine what is a carrying capacity for, say, a herd of deer on, say, a 200,000 acre state forest, or how much habitat does bear need if we're going to reintroduce bear in a part of the into a forest or part of the country where they disappeared. So it's not just uh, good to use these equations just for their own sake. They do figure in eventually into not only very abstract science, but into the realm of public policy.